first two rounds of the former 3000 championship have given us two different winners and a barrage of passes crashes and high-speed action which driver will take the win in austria we won't have to wait long to find out because round three of the former 3000 championship is next Hello and welcome to Speed Channel's live coverage of the third round of the International Formula 3000 Championship. This week, the Formula 3000 teams travel to Austria, the A1 ring. I'm Rick Rule alongside David Hobbs and Steve Matchett. Live pictures coming from Austria right now. The car is on the track and an absolutely beautiful day here, David. It's gorgeous and it's a great setting, this. It's a uh a fairly tricky circuit, but uh, power is what you need here because all these engines are exactly the same or supposed to be exactly the same. And so, so handling's got to be uh, absolutely an optimum. And there's some tricky corners around here and some uh, long blasts. So you want to make sure you get off those slow corners very quickly. Great view of the mountains in the background. And these guys just checking out the track before they're going to go out and grid up and get ready for the start. Now, it goes without saying that every Formula 3000 race pack is wheel-to-wheel -wheel action, great overtaking maneuvers, and a handful of on-track incidents. Two weeks ago in Spain, it was no different. So let's take a look back at the second round of the season from the Circuit de Catalonia in Barcelona, Spain. Once again, two weeks ago, at the start of the race, it was Giorgio Pantano. Keep an eye on him in the light blue car, the Durango leading from the pole. Jorn Wertheim in the Arden International car, close behind in second place. And look to the left. Patrick Friesacher in the white Red Bull car gets into the back of Yannick Schroeder. You can barely see it. That spins him out. Friesacher is then bumped by Rob Nguyen, sending Patrick into the path of Townsend Bell. Bell slams into the front of Friesacher's car, and that would injure Friesacher. We'll talk more about that later on. Then this is Gianna Maria here in the Durango, and Philip Giebler in the Den Bleu Arvis, both looking for the same piece of track. Unfortunately, both end up in the gravel. The early going of the race, Verdine was really pressing Pantano into turn one, but he couldn't get by because the yellow flag was out for the uh, disabled car of Giebel that was still there. Townsend Bell suffered suspension damage after the first lap incident, was falling back rapidly. There he was passed by Nguyen. Look at this, goes off into the gravel just briefly. He was just trying to hang on. Now, seven laps ago, third place runner Ricardo Sparafico, he was forced to retire because of a misfire. On the final lap, the battle for fifth with Zolt Baumgartner tried a suicidal move on Rob Newin down here, leaving his braking way too light, slid across the track and thus handed sixth position to Sony Smith and the Astro Omega, who was following them both before that. At the line, it was Giorgio Pantano and the Durango taking his second straight win in Spain. Absolutely brilliant flag-to-flag -flag run. Rounding out the podium, well, Bjorn Verheim was second, Enrico Tocicello in the Jordan Junior car finished third. Now that was the top three. Let's see how the rest of them finished off. Once again, Pantano the victor, Yaroslav Giannis was fourth, Rob Nguyen fifth, Tony Schmidt ended up sixth that day. After that, Baum, oh, Baumgartner went off the road there. Yannick Schroeder, eighth, Piccolo and ninth, Nicholas Kieda, who had had such a tremendous race in Imola two weeks before that, and then De uh, Derek Hill, unfortunately down the 11th qualified badly and didn't have a good run at all. Got hit at that first corner Shimozel as did Patrick Town in the first we saw Patrick uh, Town and Bell go off the road there. And Ricardo Spirafico, obviously we saw him go out, didn't do well. Liuzzi, Jean Maria, and then Gibbler who went out early on. Now this is the driver points as of two rounds. Bjorn Wertheim leading the way. With the first and the second, Pantano with a win. Uh, Toccatello just hanging in there with also 10 points. As for the team points, Steve, take us. Yeah, team points, no constructors, because they all use the same chassis course, but Arden International out there in the lead with 18 points, Red Bull Junior team with 13, and Durango, look at that, in third spot with 12 points. Jordan Grand Prix Junior team in 10, and then look down at the bottom end of the grid there, Dumbla Avis 0, and Brand Motorsport, of course, are now no longer part of this championship. A quick peek at the uh, front straightaway of the A1 ring as we get ready for the Formula 3000 cars to grid up. Now, as we mentioned, Spain was not exactly kind to the American drivers, so... Peter Winter, Peter Winter tracked them down to get their thoughts on the Spanish race of two weeks ago. 
and time now to catch up with our three American friends. All doing very well in Formula 3000. Derek Hill out of luck in Barcelona. Phil Giebler making a great debut and going well in Austria too. And of course Townsend Bell continuing to improve with every race. Well, I just went into um, turn one after a good start and just uh, was almost through it and I got hit in the right rear. So I didn't really know who hit me or how that occurred, but uh, it was unfortunate. It bent, it towed out the rear uh, tire and also added some camber. So I had to come in and get new tires and, and it just uh, overheated the rear tires as the race went on. So uh, it was unfortunate because I think we had a very good car and would have been able to make up some places in the race for sure. Yeah, it definitely ended a little bit earlier than I wanted to. Um, it would have been a good experience to get a full race distance and just more knowledge on the on the circuit and the, and the car. And uh, unfortunately, got together with another car. Um, I was trying to get around him a few times around the the previous lap, and he was blocking me um, two or three, four times. Um, so it was really just getting frustrated. And, I, and the thing I was uh, saying to myself right before I got out on the track was, I just need to finish the race and get a full distance. You know, we finished both races. At Barcelona, the car was bent up and the side pod banged up and we were sliding around, but I ran the distance and got the experience. So I'm just looking for a little bit of luck and trying to put the whole weekend together so we can, we can have a solid one. Ah, waiting for racing luck. Yeah, they're all waiting. There sounds to me like too many of them are waiting for too much racing luck. Uh, they, they need to do better in qualifying is what they need to do. All right, well, they're gridding up the cars. We are going to take a brief break while they get the cars onto the grid. Because, you know, we're not quite done talking about the Spanish Grand Prix for the, pardon me, the uh, F3000 race. I'm so he's talking Formula One. We'll talk more about it when we come back and hear from all the drivers who were involved in that first turn incident. Stick around. Speed Channel's coverage of Formula 3000 is brought to you by Odor Eaters Plus Arch Support Insoles, the only arch supporting insole that protects against foot odor and wetness. Welcome back to Austria. You're looking at the replacement for Patrick Riesacker. That is the man, young man who's going to replace him. You barely see him. Looks like the guy from, uh, used to peek over the backyard fence. Is Ricardo Spirifico, our pole sitter. Now, we need to talk about what happened two weeks ago when we saw what appeared to be a harmless collision in the first turn of the race. The incident, in fact, happened so fast, we failed to realize the severity of the crash or how many cars were really involved. So, that's why we have Peter Windsor, who's able to chase down the drivers and find out what really happened. Couldn't find two circuits more different than Barcelona and Austria here in the mountains. Even so, the talk is still at that first corner shunt in the Spanish F3000 race. Who started it? Who caused it? What were the results? I had a chat up and down the F3000 paddock. There were cars everywhere around me, so I didn't have a choice to do anything. So I just take my line without touching car and somebody hit me at the, at the rear and the hit make me spam. So that was it. I couldn't do nothing. So, Who do you think it was that hit you? I, I really don't have an idea because I didn't see the video and I really don't know who was uh, the driver behind me. Out of the, the right corner of my eye, I could see someone's left front tire kind of lurch towards me and, and I think that was Freisiger got into my uh, right rear and punched a hole in the side pod and I, I heard that he got hit but I still don't know exactly what happened down there. We just, we just got run into again. So it's frustrating but these things happen. No one's doing it on purpose. On the inside, I saw somebody come from behind. I'm not sure who it was, but he was unable to brake as he had two wheels on the grass, and that caused a bit more drama, you could say. But uh, I saw two or three people on the left side, which had to take the gravel road, including myself. Um, but we came onto the circuit. I mean, the car was unscathed, so that was all right. No, I couldn't make out what was going on. I just saw a white car going sideways, and uh, I was trying to avoid everything I could. So. Um, no, I, th I think uh, Patrick Friesacker got hit from behind and uh, that kind of caused a, a big mess in the first corner. Yeah, I think actually uh, the, the television didn't quite cover it. So um, I did see the, the picture though in uh, one of the magazines that showed exactly what happened. We, um, I think uh, one of the cars starting way back tapped somebody and it set off a chain reaction. And uh, I'm not sure who hit me, I couldn't tell. Somebody from behind crashed into me and then I went forward in the, in the car in front of me and I hit somewhere in my arm and now the arm is broken 
But you know, it's a shame because it's my home race here and I almost can cry when I see them going out, but that's racing and so I'm going to look forward for the next race from Monaco. No real culprit then. One has to feel sorry, however, for Patrick Friesacker, particularly, as he said, as this is his home race. Let's hope he's fit and well for Monaco. Well, Derek Hill said he, uh, the, the picture explained it perfectly, but he still didn't explain what exactly happened. And because he said somebody coming from the back, well, he qualified eighth. Uh, something that Derek's going to have to, there's uh, Townsend Bell. Townsend Bell, one of three Americans in the race today. In fact, there were more Americans in the last Formula 3000 race than there were in the kart race. <laughs> Think about that, three Americans. Yeah. And at one point when they were talking about who was going to replace in Red Bull, they were talking about whether it was going to be one of the four guys, maybe Joel Nelson, who might be brought up from the Red Bull search program. We could have had four Americans in a Formula 3000 race. Some Austrian beauties there, listening to the sound of music. Uh, Patrick Friesacker there, of course, broke his arm. It didn't look like much of an accident because that is always one of the dangers in a racing car when you're holding the steering wheel. If that front wheel you know, hits a wall or gets hit by another car, it doesn't seem to do much, but of course it, it wrenches the wheel in your hand so quickly and you can easily break that bone uh, in, your, in your wrist, which is exactly what happened to Tony Canaan, who qualified in a, in a cast uh, second last week for the Indy 500. So. We're going to take another break when we come back. We're going to have yet another report from Peter Wynn. This time, we're going to go tech. We're going to talk with David Sears and get the lowdown of the Spec Zytec engines. We'll be back with more on Speed Channel right after this. Welcome back as we see the cars lining up on the grid here in Austria. You know, as we all know, the Formula 3000 series uses a spec Zytec V8 engine. So we want to learn a little bit more about this power plant. So we spent our own Peter Winter to help us better understand those motors. Peter? Lots of common parts to Formula 3000, Avon tires, Lola chassis, and of course, Zytec engines. I spoke to David Sears of Supernova to chat about Zytec, about the performance of the engine, what the sort of mileages they get from them, the reliability factor, what they rev to, about most things under the sun, in fact. It's really a benchmark engine. I think it's extremely reliable. Um, the old engines before they came in as a one-make uh, engine were probably producing about 40 horsepower more, about uh, 510. These produced around 470, 475. Um, which is quick enough. I mean, we could do with a bit more power, I think, now, because the gap to Formula 1 has, has got bigger. And what, what sort of rev limit do you have? 9,000. I mean, I think with the exhaust this year, they sound much, much better, but I think that if they rev to maybe 12,000 and had a bit more power, I think they'd be close to Formula 1. And what's the situation with fuel now? Everybody's still doing their own fuel from team to team. Yeah, I mean, we've got a spec fuel, but, I mean, basically, some people say it's not as good as the other fuels that we've had but I mean it, you know as long as the engines are reliable and everybody's got the same thing I think the real point of this category is to try and find the best drivers and if you can make it as equal as possible the teams can only twiddle with their uh, damping and, and wings and everything on the day and I think that's probably attention to detail is probably the most critical area. There's no question that in this year's form the Zytec engine does sound better than in 2002. It's reliable it's quick enough, probably, although as David Sears says, we could do with a bit more horsepower to bring it nearer to Formula One. But otherwise, difficult to criticize the Zytec end of the Formula 3000 program. Yeah, good port report there by Peter. I think these engines really are quick enough. 470 brake horsepower at 9,000 RPM. The thing is, they're not Formula One engines. And, and I think by lifting, attempting to lift the rev range to get more power out of them, will introduce that unreliability factor in the, into the engine. I don't think the Sport in F3000 needs that. I think we want to see that all the cars finish and reliability improve, and um, I would just leave them exactly as they are. And as David Sears said, this is really the, the, the big object here is to sort out the driver, so you want the cars as equal as possible. David Sears himself used to be a pretty good peddler, but his dad, Gentleman Jack Sears, used to be an absolute superstar in English saloon car racing back in the... Uh, late 50s and 60s and he used to drive a Jaguar 3.8 Mark II with extreme verb. Pretty good bloke, old David's dad was. All right, Yaroslav Yanis getting ready to get in the car so he can go racing. We're going to take a brief break. When we come back, David Hobb is going to show us the way around this A1 ring in Austria. Don't go away. 
Back here at Austria, Bernhard Auinger getting into the car, getting ready to get in the car. Think about this, first time ever in a Formula 3000 car, you're climbing in to go racing. A little bit of pressure there. All right, David, take us around the A1 ring. Explain to us what this track is like. Well, these guys are a bit short on horsepower, and as you can see, there's uh, three, may four major blasts down to corners. The, the long straight up to the castle curve is quite steep uphill there, so you really want to come off the A1 curve well to get into the castle curve, which is where a lot of overtakings are going to go on. Downhill to Remus curve, difficult corner Remus, very tight and very badly sighted when you get there. The run down to the Gossett curve, another tricky one. It's all downhill all through the Dickie Lauder, the power horse, very fast left-handers. Jochen Rint, a fast right-hander, and as I say, the A1 curve, very important. Just under 2.7 miles, and of course these guys are about 13 seconds a lap slower than the Formula One guy this weekend. Ricardo Sparafico on the pole this weekend after dropping out last weekend with a misfire problem. This week he gets to start at the front of the grid. Yeah, he could have done with those points last week, there's no doubt about it. It was interesting earlier on, watching the world feed come in, how careful the mechanics are with cleaning all the grit off the tyres that they're putting on, and also Bjorn Wildheim's mechanics were actually sweeping the track in front of the car there to make sure that they could get the best traction possible. No traction control on these cars, no launch control either. Take every little ounce of advantage they can. We'll be back with more from Austria after this. Welcome back to Speed Channel's live coverage of the Formula 3000 Championship from Austria. As we wait for this race to get started, we want to take a moment and look back at last season's race here at Austria. It began with Thomas Enga on the pole, and at the start, Giorgio Pantano challenged him into the Castrol curve, but Enga managed to hold the position amazingly. Everybody managed to make it through safely. It was a pretty amazing. Still on the first lap, heading into the Remus curve. Wardham gets under both Colony cars of Pantano and Enrico Toccacella for second. Further back in the pack, Sebastian Bordet got hit by Rose Briscoe in the Nordic, ending Bordet's day. Pass of the day, battle for 15th, Rodrigo Spirifico in the light blue Durango locked up the tires to outbreak Tiago Montero. Ten laps to go, local hero Patrick Friesacker is challenged by Enrico Tuccicello for sixth, but Friesacker holds him off, much to the delight of the crowd. David Salines was set to score Minardi's first points of the year, but while running in fifth position, suffered electrical failure and forced to retire. Three laps to go, Pantano is all over. Mario Haberfeld in the white, Astromiga for third space. They get side by side, but Pantano can't take the position away. At the checkered flag, it was Thomas Enga followed by Bjorn Verdheim making it an Arden International 1-2 finish. Enga was overjoyed in Park for May. Check this out. He nearly tackles Verdheim. He's so happy. Knocks him down. Aberfield joins him on the podium by finishing third. That ended up being his second podium of the season. And these are the look at the previous winners at the Austrian Formula 3000 race. Thomas Enga, a bunch of known nobodies like Nick Heidfeld, some guy named Montoya. Justin Wilson there, who's racing in the, Minard the Minardi this year. Nicholas Manassian, who came back for the one race earlier on this year, tried to cart last year. Um, and of course, as you say, won Pablo Montoya won this race in 1997. All right, time now for one last commercial break before the start of the third round of the Formula 3000 championship. In fact, when we come back, the cars are going to be set to roll off. Welcome back to Speed Channel's live coverage of the Formula 3000 race from Austria. Rick Brule alongside David Hobbs and Steve Matchett here to bring you all the action. The third round of the series, and we have three Americans in this race. One of them starting in the second row. Another one in the fourth row. For Phil Giebler, that is a great start. He qualified eighth today, and this is only second time in the car. Absolutely. It was, it was a terrific start. That's a terrific qualifying performance for him. Of course, these guys, no tire warmers or anything like that. Uh, control tire made by Avon. So that's one of the reasons they were picking all that gravel off, because they're just trying to help the tires every bit they possibly can, because these, yeah. these, these guys are starting on cold tires, which, of course, makes that first corner it's that gonna much be more hair-raising. Very interesting going into that castral curve. Uh, and you're right, no tire warmers on these things. And we're hearing, you know, throughout the weekend, they're a very hard compound as well, so they're going to have very little grip. And you saw the clouds are starting to cool down the track just a little bit. Well, these car tires aren't quite as sensitive to uh, the temperature changes. Once again, everybody has a spec tire. They're all running the exact same tire, the exact same engine, the exact same chassis. And the only difference is the way you set it up and that guy right there, the driver in the cockpit. And, of course, the fact is it's incredibly close racing this. You know, we've got uh, 
very little time covering this entire field. All right, time for the cars to uh, head off, make sure they all get started. Remember, we're only starting with 17 cars. We lost one of them, Jeffrey Van Hoydonk, who was driving for Team Astro Omega, unfortunately ran out of money. As a result, his car is missing from the grid, didn't even make it to the race. And everybody gets away cleanly. All right, since all the cars are away, let's find out how they're gonna line up for today's race. Guy on the pole, Ricardo Sparafico, his third pole. Beside him, the man who's leading the points right now, Bjorn Wertheim. Row two is Vitantio Lucci in the first of the Red Bull cars, and alongside him is Townsend Bell in the second Arden car, the highest grid position ever for an American driver in Formula 3000, only three tenths off pole. Row three, Giorgio Pantano, who won the last race. Beside him, Tony Schmidt. Row four, Enrico Toccacello in the Jordan Grand Prix junior team, currently third in points. And next to him is Californian Phil Giebel, as you said, only his second F3 outing. What a great uh, qualifying for Phil. Row number five is Zolt Baumgartner and Yaroslav Yanis. Row six, 23-year-old Alessandro Piccolo in the BCN car, an old team Nordic racing with a new owner. And uh, next to him, another American driver, Derek Hill, son of world champion Phil Hill, but he's got to do better in qualifying. Row seven is Nicholas Kies, and beside him, the guy we were just talking about, Bernhard Auinger. Imagine that first time out in this car. You're in a race in front of your home crowd. He's from Austria. And we've got Rob Newen from Australia. In the, uh, in the chassis alongside him is Yannick Schroeder. We saw him earlier on. He got punted off on the first lap last week. He's also starting near the back today. Not a good spot to be. Row nine belongs exclusively to Raphael Jean-Marie. He started in the last place last time. He gets it all to himself because, as we mentioned, Jeffrey Van Hoydonk didn't come up with the funding. As a result, he is going to miss this race. And Phil Giebler only managed to come up with his funding at the last minute. Remember, he uh, he made a race, the last race in Spain, pulled it together, and now they've come up with funding for this race, the Living Race to Race. Real briefly, let's talk about the weather. As I mentioned, starting to cloud up just a little bit. Temperature, while it has risen a little bit during the course of the day, it's at 70 degrees right now and not likely to go up too much more. Very slight breeze. The breeze has picked up a little bit, but right now, sunny and dry conditions. Yeah, and virtually no humidity, which is uh, nice for the drivers and the spectators, of course. A bit uh, cool for them in the breeze. These guys trying to put some heat in their tyres, of course, because I say no tyre warmers, but they all stay to the left of the track here, staying on the clean side of the track as they come out of that corner. We saw a lot of dirt being kicked up earlier on in qualifying. They've probably brushed the track since then, but these guys making sure they stay on the left side of the track uh, until the last minute when they pull over to their grid position. Both uh, Ricardo Sparafico and Bjorn Wertheim really put a lot of rubber down when they left the grid on that formation lap because that's going to help them all being well on this launch start. Remember, it's all down to the driver's input, no electronic assistance, but that's what they put that rubber down for just to try and aid the traction away. And they are going to be stonking up to that first corner. Stonking? Aye. Yeah, trying to get there quick, you mean, lad. Steel never... brakes as well, so... <laughs> It's going to be very, very fraught, this first corner. All right, look at the lineup on all those cars. There's some, some of the cars just a little on the twist of that. Pantano, Pantano in the light blue car there. The third row. It's not, and it's box. I don't know where All that's... right, here they go. We're starting in Austria, Formula 3000. Ricardo Sparafico on the pole. Some good starts for Zolt Baumgartner, squeezed into the middle. Meanwhile, it is Ricardo Sparafico in the front. Behind him, Bjorn Verdheim. And Townsend Bell, you see... He was go He slid off. To he managed to stay really on the track. That was the battle for third right there. Well, quite a few cars running right, but because of that asphalt trap now that they've laid down there, no real problem. Townsend Bell going out the inside. It's Liuzzi there. going oh. ahead of him right there. And then Pantano's going to get him as well. It. Oh, Townsend Bell got badly left out in the cold there, going through the Remus curve. He was just on the outside, and he didn't need to be there. He didn't want to be there. He's not. He's back in... Uh, now you yeah, got Bjorn Verdon making goes, a move on Ricardo Spirafico on the there. outside. Can't do it, but does he set him up for the next turn? So great start by uh, Spirafico to take the lead. And he still holds the lead. So Spirafico hanging on to the lead from Wardheim. Then Luzzi, then Pantano behind him. There you see Ricardo Sparafico, there's Bjorn Verdheim, Liuzzi, Giorgio Pentano, and there's Townsend Bell. Townsend Bell's moved back up, so he's right behind Pentano now. 
Remember, in the first race of the year, when Pantano was right behind Townsend Bell and ended up punting him out. Yeah. Maybe it's payback time. Pantano, very aggressive driver, did a lot of overtaking last year. Oh! oh. Townsend took a look to the inside, but decided not to do it. A lot of people taking a lot of Whoa. looks. Big, big lock up there. That's Derek Hill right That's there in the yellow good. car. Yeah, and you can see already the marbles offline going into that first turn. Be very careful feeding yourself through there now. Now these tires. Ooh, look at the slide as Ricardo yeah. goes through there. Speaking of tires. Yeah, control tires, they're very hard. It's about seven or eight laps before they've really started to come in, and then they've been dropping off very quick afterwards. Phil Giebler's lost out badly there, back to 10th. Der Der Derek Hill back to 13th from 8th. That's not what he needs at all, because these are incredibly tight fields. You've just got to, you've got to qualify well, and you've got to start well, because if you don't qualify well, you get caught out in all that first lap maneuvering, and it's, it's just impossible. Talking with Townsend Bell this morning, he was saying that... Uh, He's never raced here before, obviously, but he, one thing he did do a little, about two months ago, he got in one of those, like an Opel Lotus, Voxel Lotus type car, one of those uh, Formula Spec cars they have over there, did a few laps around just so he could get at least used to the track a little bit. But once again, that wasn't at speed, and it wasn't in an F3000 car. Yeah, well, it'll certainly help him to have learned the track, got the idea of the circuit layout, which must be a big advantage going into these sort of races cold with no idea of the layout where your breaking points are and the apex of the different turns it's going to catch you out so it would have helped him enormously Carlos Sperafico here making a bit of a play Luzzi uh, all over Bjorn Wordheim in second spot I remember, like Steve was saying, that the tires don't really heat up until you get eight or ten laps into it. So at this point, the tires are still coming up to temperature. They, they get up to temperature, but then if you're not careful, if you, if you abuse them on the way up, uh, they'll go down again pretty quick, too. They yeah. start to lose their performance. Look at Tony Liuzzi just starting to close in on Bjorn Verdheim. Pantano and then Townsend Bell. Townsend Bell there in fifth spot still. There's the first five. The first three running away a bit from Pantano. Pantano got that great victory in the last race, and that was only the third victory ever for the Durango team. This is the A1 curve. It's the beginning of the Formula 1, guys. A lot of trouble this weekend. It's slippery, and it's got a lot of dirt built up on it now. And, um, there you see the field streaming by, nobody going over the in-car, uh, the in-ground camera there. You see Townsend kind of protecting his line just a little bit as he moves because he's got that car behind him that was taking a look. It's Tony Schmidt right behind Townsend Bell in the yellow car. Meanwhile, up front, Ricardo Spirofico not under attack, although right behind him, Bjorn Verdheim sees Liuzzi in his mirrors, but no one seems to be able to actually make any kind of a move David well of course this is one of the things with uh, when formulas become very even everybody thinks that it's going to be very you know very close very even racing and this is pretty close racing there's no doubt about it but you know nobody can make a move it's, it's no. hard to make up any ground on anybody there's just no way you can do it this is a replay of the start we're watching now oh Derek Hill got hit there Derek Hill in the yellow car just going off the screen there Look, here we see the blue car comes across it. Just, 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 just not quite the left it. rear. But he lifted off there, and that's how he lost, like four places. Boom, like that going up. Now, what happens as we go up into turn one? Very tight. You see the back part of the field starts to go wide, but the uh, the asphalt saves the problem. And if that was the old gravel trap there, the half would have been, been already yeah. stuck in there, yeah. So that's worked very well. But you're right, these cars are so evenly matched, of course. Really, all the teams can do, horsepower is set, of course, as we talked about at the top of the show, is play with the aerodynamics. You And as we're seeing in the F1 qualifying show, you trim the wing off to try and maximize the straight line speed, or you put it on to help it through the tight infield section. Remember you know, the, the first, curve. Remember the first race of the season, Mr. Excitement, Nicholas Chiesa? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's the guy who almost hit Derek yeah. Hill. <laughs> we're going to call him Mr. Contact. Contact Chiesa. Bjorn Verdheim is in second place, but he has set the fastest lap again. So he's trying to reel in the leader, Ricardo Sparafico. 
We're going to take a quick break from Austria. We'll be back with more right after this. Speed Channel's coverage of the Formula 3000 Championship is brought to you by Audi. In technology, performance, and design, our goal remains constant. Never follow. Back in Austria, where Bjorn Wertheim in second place continues to peel off fastest laps as he pursues the guy at the front of the pack, Ricardo Spirifico, but he's still got a ways to go. Lips is all over him now. He seems to have fallen back on that. This is an incident that happened a moment ago. That's Derek Hill in the yellow car. Derek Hill. He's trying to pass Rob Nguyen. Oop. And, un and then Alessandro Piccolo, they're, they're bumping the wheels yeah. again there. Yeah, they were bumping wheels. So in that whole thing, he lost out a couple of spots there. And then the white car, that's Bernhard Auinger, who's starting his very first Formula 3000 race right behind him. Derek Hill was saying that uh, he was actually having back problems this morning. In fact, he was being associated with the Jordan team. He was having the Jordan physical therapist work on him before the race. Back up front, the blue car. That is Giorgio Pantano you saw right there. Last year's winner, and uh, last week's winner, or two weeks ago. And this just shows how competitive this whole formula is. Uh, Pantano on the pole last year, last week, won from uh, light to flag. And this week, he's running there in uh, seventh spot. But uh, he's going nowhere because these cars, like we say, are just so evenly matched. Here's uh, Werdheim coming under pressure from Luizzi. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, Werdheim was gaining on him lap after lap, and then suddenly he's fallen back in the clutches of Luizzi, and either Sparafico's starting to move out. Well, you see, he just said fastest lap, so he must be moving out. I think that Werdheim now is uh, probably more worried about keeping Luizzi behind him than he is uh, trying to catch up with uh, Sperafico, which is one of those dangers when you start to block people, you start losing speed, oh, which is right. what good for Pantano, because he can see them both duking it out, he wants to catch him up, and it's good for Town and Bell, who's just behind Pantano. Now, we keep talking about how even to match these cars on, how little the teams can do to change the setup from one to another. <laughs> oh, that's Gian Maria in the back of the pack. Yeah, and that's the A1 corner that we've been seeing all weekend. With their big brothers as well. All we're going to get wrong, but of course, what the teams can do as far as setup. There he is going wide. The guy behind <laughs> taking evasive action there, going to the inside. The Don't teams, know he uh, to pick him up or not. The teams can change the spring rates and the roll bar rates, of course, on these cars to make the cars stiffer or softer. Now, what that'll do to the cars when the tyres change, that's going to be the important thing. When these tyres start to go off and you get a lot of oversteer coming into the car, if you've set the car up for the later stages of the race when that comes into its own, you could well find that the cars will start to pull away from one another relative to how the chassis setup is. And again, there's not much you can do, but that may play out in the later stages. Really start to watch these tyres go off around lap 20. That's about two-thirds of the way through the race. It's a 35-lap race, but by lap 20, these tyres will be screwed, or at least that's been the way it has, has been for the last couple of races. Herdheim now resets the fastest lap and closed the gap down a little bit to Sperafico and pulled it away a little bit from uh, Antonio Buzzi. I'm glad his team called him Tonio because uh, his first name is a bit of a mouthful of the way. <laughs> a couple extra syllables that they throw in there. This camera shot actually gives a great indication of how hilly yeah. this track is, yeah. isn't it? From the onboards, it doesn't look that hilly. There's Derek Hill languishing back now in the 14th spot, qualified eight. He was saying that uh, he really wasn't comfortable with the car after qualifying. He said they made four major changes. And he said, frankly, the setup is going to be a gamble on this car. I think, oh, I think that's very much. There, going quick through those downhill left-handers. He's having a big look at uh, Alessandro Piccolo. And remember, this is only Piccolo's second race as well. Yeah, I think that's quite understandable, Rick, what you say about the, the setup being a gamble. Because the setup of the car depends so much on the tyres. Here we go, he's, he's, gonna, he's gonna stay right behind him as they come out of the A1 corner because Derek Hill's gonna have trouble behind him, which is... Uh, Bernhard Allinger right Allinger behind him. In only his very first Formula 3000 race. Ooh, up to the Castle Curve, he couldn't pull it off then. Needs to get tucked right under the wing of Piccolo there, get a good draft. Meanwhile, back at the front, 
blue car there. That is Pantano, who's in fourth, right behind him. Townsend Bell continues to hold fifth. And Tony Schmidt continues to hold sixth. Remember now, points this year in Formula 3000, just like Formula 1, goes all the way back to eighth, meaning that Zolt Baumgartner is in the final points position just ahead of Nicholas Chiesa. And leading the points right now is Bjorn Wertheim, by virtue of winning the first race and getting second in the second race. And if you're thinking championship, you don't want to be making any mistakes up front that are going to cost you, because that's what happened to Giorgio Pantano in the very first race well, when he ended up getting, knocking himself out as he tried to go around Townsend Bell. I keep saying that uh, Derek Hill qualified eighth, because he didn't qualify eighth. That, that was, was Phil, uh, Giebler. Phil Giebler. He qualified 12th, and he's now dropped to 14th. But this just shows how qualifying in these former 3,000 races, I mean, you've really got to suck it up and do a good job in qualifying, because you're just dead meat if you start at the back of these races. Yeah. There's no way you're going to get to the front. Keep thinking somebody's going to do something. Whoa. Oh, look at Derek. He's now, working he lost really hard. Ground. That Auringer right behind him. He might lose that position now because Auringer snapped. Oh, and he is right behind him yeah. now. He's try yeah. Do you see Derek try to defend going all the way over smoothly? Oh, oh he locks oh. it up. Does he hold it? Ah. Nope. Auringer goes by. No, he lost it there. Now Gianna Maria is coming up behind him. He tried to slowly move over and not make too many moves because you, you can only make one move to defend your position. He, so he kind of drifted over, and then he broke way too late going in there, and as a result, he, he slid just a touch wide. Yep. Yeah. There was a big lock up there. I'm trying to look for the well, flat spots the on the tires. Started. All the trouble there started down at the, at the A1 corner, which has been so important this weekend. He, he lost out to Auringer, then he tried to get it all back on braking. Of course, it was way too, he braked way too late, took himself wide, and Auringer made the pass. And pretty heads up move by Owinger. I mean, he's a brand very new. Up he's, move. he's a four, you know ran German Formula Three last year, and Ooh, uh, he had that. That would be some nasty flat spots on yeah. those tires too. So he's going to have vibration for, for the yeah. rest of the race now. He was doing Euro F3 this year, but he had the intelligence not to follow in and to take advantage of Derek Hill's mistake. We're going to take a quick break from Formula 3000 in Austria. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Speed Channel's live coverage of the Formula 3000 race from Austria. Rick DeBrule, David Hobbs, Steve Matchett. That guy right there is Giorgio Pantano, who has managed to get by Tonio Liuzzi, and he has third. Let's we'll take another look and see exactly how that pass happened. Yeah, coming down to Remus, dragged it out. Ooh, good. Oh. Flustered Liuzzi who went wide and they look at this side by side engine so close in performance. I mean, this is not an easy pass. It's look not. at this long side by side by side coming down to the Gosser curve now. And he had the inside line and did not overdo it, didn't go in too fast and have to slow up to let Liuzzi by again. So Pantano, I must say, last year when we did the Formula 3000 at the end of the year there, he did an awful lot of overtaking last year. He really did. He's a bit of an ace at the old overtaking. There's no doubt about yeah, it. And Pantano did a good job to pull that off because he too locked up the tyres there, didn't he? Yeah. The first of the opening part of that uh, overtaking. Yeah. Well, take, now take a Bell's look at that. Got Bell's gotten by Liuzzi as well. I wonder if Liuzzi's having a problem. You know, we, we weren't able to show it to you. We didn't get the picture to see that. We also saw just a few moments ago Derek Hill having a problem. We're going to show you that. Look what happened with Derek. Ooh, at the A1. Oh, Shades of Ralph Furman yesterday, yeah, because this much. is the Jordan Junior team. Goes wide at the A1 corner. Ooh, gets wide. Of course, Jan Maria gets by him. So now Derek Hill's gone back another spot. That's uh, Piccolo trying to get by Nguyen, and instead Bernhard Auingert moves up another spot. That's the battle for 13th right there, I believe. With Derek Hill in the yellow car in the back. So Rob Nguyen in front. And here goes Auringer again. He, boy, he's aggressive for his first time out. One of he these is. cars. Plus the Red Bull, good team. Butzi is his teammate. Now this was Piccolo trying to go around Nguyen. Piccolo going to the outside. And then... Because they both had to slow up to avoid each other, <laughs> yeah. which let Auringer pass Piccolo. And now he's right behind Rob Nguyen. He was having a look there as they go to the Jochenrint curve, very fast downhill sweeper. Now to the A1. This is the, this is the one he wants to track you here well. Stay tucked under the wing of Rob Nguyen as they come down this long 
starts off downhill, but then it goes very steeply uphill. So you want a bit of momentum coming up here. He's going for the inside. Now he decides to go for the outside. Is he going to be at? Comes off the ah. Oh, it may be a good move. Can he make oh. it work? Oh, Newen pushing oh, him onto the grass there. Oh, how far can you go? He's not giving him an inch, is no, he? No, he's not. Boy, this could end. Look at the way those two guys slowing each other down, and Piccolo's catching them back up again. And Derek Hill right behind them. Boy, Bernhard Auinger trying really hard to make the move on Nguyen. And now look at this pack. Hill's got a good run out of the corner that time. Derek Hill in the yellow car trying to get past Piccolo. Remember, this is the battle for 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th on the track. And these guys are working. Bernhard Auinger trying a different line again. Rob Nguyen wants to be careful here. He doesn't get... Oh, there goes Piccolo on the inside. Auringer on the outside. Derek Hill's trying to go by. Oh, Boy, hang on, ah. buddy. Oh. Boy, Auringer's getting a, <laughs> a very uh, tough introduction into Formula 3000. These guys all behaving. Uh, I can't believe Auringer hung on to the spot. I can't. I can't believe they haven't got these wheels tangled up. No. So now he's going to have Especially just on that last oh, corner. Oh, it looked like Piccolo was getting loose right there. He got loose. And now. You got Auinger making the move. Auinger on the outside coming to... I don't think he can do that one. And I think when we see behind the, the red... Yeah, Hill yeah, has gotten is. past Piccolo. Derek Hill got a great move. And Yannick Schroeder right behind them and Jean-Maria behind them. All right, here. Hill trying to make a move. Takes a different line around Auinger. Can he make it? Oh, oh look at Auinger wide. slide! And Piccolo was sliding oh. behind that. Auinger. Wow. Is Auinger's car going off now? Now he's doing the Rob Newin holding uh, Derek Hill at bay there. Well, be careful they don't get caught out weaving here. They get a black flag. Derek tried to make the move, but he was on the outside. Came off the corner better than Auinger there. So, meanwhile, Rob Newin is uh, breathing a sigh of relief as he's managed to pull ahead of this. Uh, battling duo and take a look all the way in the back if we can see it again it's piccolo all the way back he, when he dropped that wheel off he moved back behind so he's at the back of the oh back. oh, oh. Went off. Auinger went wide at the gossip curve so yeah. two people slipped by him Derek Hill got by him easily well I gotta tell you I don't know what he's how he's gonna yes, finish Yannick. up but he's got great entertainment factor today <laughs> this new guy Yannick Schroeder got by him as well now he after all that work he's got to work his way back up now then, can Derek Hill wind in Rob Nguyen and get by him? You know, Nguyen has to think, boy, just keep beating each other up behind me, guys. I like it when you do that. Leave me alone. Bernhard Auringer having a treme <laughs> tremendous introduction to Formula 3000 racing. All right, let's take another look at it. This is from earlier. This is when Auinger went out, went a little wide. This is turn one. Oh, and that's one. when Piccolo, see oh, when he yeah. spun. He actually spun all the way around. I wonder what had happened to Piccolo. That explains it. Look at them all slide. Look at them oh. all sliding there. Oh, yep, and there he goes, Piccolo. Oh, boy. They were all pretty sideways there. Now remember, this is only Piccolo's second Formula 3000 race. He was drafted last week to join the team. Whew. That's all good stuff. It is very good. Oh, there it goes. That's got caught Auringer out of the gossip curve there. Yeah. Went in too deep, got wide. Luckily, didn't get himself beached in the gravel. Meanwhile, back up front, it's a nice, calm environment. Amazingly, everybody's still running, but look at the gap. Back to third place. Once again, Formula 3000s here at Austria. We'll be right back. Welcome back. That is the continuing battle. Derek Hill trying to take Rob Nguyen. This is the battle for 12th. Oh, no. Oh. Yeah, he got clipped. I thought he was going to make it around without any damage. Yeah, what a shame. He had done a good job in making the pass, but now he's doomed with no front wing. He's actually had it. He's going to have to go and have that replaced. And the question is, are they going to be able to cleanly get out there to get that? Well, he's going to have to come back in. Remember, there are normally no pit stops in this series. You make a pit stop, and oh, well. you're severely out of sorts. And that's Yannick Schroeder right behind Nguyen right now. The thing is, he had it done. I mean, he'd made the pass. He got it all over with, done it, and then went and did that spin, which sort of looked a little bit unnecessary to me, but uh, there's the master's got the wing. Yeah. Good move. Got out there quickly. Well, coming up tomorrow, live coverage of the Formula One Austrian Grand Prix.
In fact, our live coverage will start at 7.30 in the morning Eastern time with the Accurate Free Race Show. And as always, in the winter, we'll get us caught up with all the latest news from the paddock. That's tomorrow morning at 7.30 Eastern time, only on speed. There you see how he went wide. Look how th th his right front tire's going off, too. Look at this with Auringer. Look, just it was Auringer that got his... Uh, yeah. I'll tell you what, old uh, Derek Hill's front tires look pretty rooted to me, and that could have been that huge lock-up he had a few laps back. I think you're right. You can see those distinctive black look stripes, right? He gets just... very close. Oh, my oh, God. God. He clipped. How he didn't take... He nearly took all three of them out. That was close. Yeah. That was very close. Nice. Well, yeah, they can change the nose on the car, like, like you said, Rick, but it's not going to be a quick change. Well, and of course, you know, as Rick said, no pit stops in these races, so no. once he stops, he's done for. But he isn't going to score points yet again. And at the beginning There's of the... Schrader, Yannick, Yannick Schroeder trying to go around Rob Newin. Rob Newin's driving very aggressively today. He's holding everybody off. He's using up all the roads available to him. Remember, there's only the battle for 12th. There we have Derek Hill, and in talking with Derek Hill at the beginning of the season, he made it very clear this is a very important year for him. He needs some good results, and he just has not been able to make it happen just because yet. Because you've got to remember that this is Derek Hill's third season in Formula 3000, and he's driving with an excellent team, the old uh, Supernova team. And, um, you know, he needs to get results with this team. Look at this, the lead. Ricardo Sperafico holding off. Bjorn Wernheim, Wernheim, if he finishes in second, he is going to pick up a huge amount of points. Oh, and that's oh, Yannick Schroeder. Schroeder. Yeah, Schroeder had been, uh, had been back there trying to work on New Yin and just apparently, uh, as a result of the battle, he has ended up off. Let's see what happened. Right, so look at it. Oh, it's John Maria going on the inside of him. Oh. Oh, John Maria, who had started last in the other Durango car, tried to go to the inside. And Schroeder. Oh, Yannick yeah. Schroeder won't be thinking too much about that because he was concentrating on trying to get by Rob Ewan himself and um, got punted off there by Gian Maria. So uh, he won't be very happy with that because Yannick Schroeder actually, you know, had four points going into this. So he's going to be stuck on four points. And uh, people are going to be moving up around him. Ricardo Sperafico with six points. He needs this win. That'll give him 16. But Ward Verdheim, with a, if he scores an eight for second, he's going to go on to 26, so he's going to have a 10-point margin. And Bjorn Verdheim would be one of the, really a big recipient of the new point-scoring system because under the old point-scoring system, he would have been getting six points for second place. He got eight last time. If he gets eight this time, that's an extra four points he will have this year compared to the system that would have been last, last year. year. And Giorgio Pantana, who won two weeks ago, is... Whoa, 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 whoa. Be good now. Oh, that could cost him a lot of time there. Oh, Wertheim's going to pounce on that. If he Smelling can. blood. Uh, he wasn't quite close. No, enough. I don't think he was. Well, Sparafico looking in the mirrors. Yeah, it's unnerved him, hasn't it? Yeah. You've got to be very careful here not to lose your concentration when that sort of thing happens. Carlos Sparafico driving for Coloni. And, of course, Verdheim driving for Arden. Arden based in Banbury, England, just right in my old stamping grounds. Of course, Christian Horner runs that team. He raced them a little bit, but then decided he could do a better job running a team than he could uh, racing himself, and has been very successful. Oh, again! Uh, Pantano's up. I mean, uh, Sparafico getting just a little bit uh, rattled here by the look of things. Well, yeah. And if you're Bjorn Verdheim, you smell blood. You need to get up there and challenge him and make him make a big mistake. Well, even a little one right now would do just fine. <laughs> well, he's making the little ones on his own. You want to make him make a big one. All right, a little bit of a gap. Well, it looks like Bjorn's not going to attack this lap. We're going to take a brief break. We'll be back with more to see whether he can attack the leader right after this. Back in Austria for the Formula 3000 race, and this guy, Bernhard Auringer, managing to come back. He's passed Rob Nguyen finally. He's on a charge. That's once again for 12th on the track. And then Piccolo is the red, that's Nguyen in the red car, the first red car, then Piccolo, then Jean Maria in the blue car, the Durango car right behind. It's going to be interesting to see if Auringer, now he's on his own in front of this lot, can pull out a bit of time on him. The problem is, well, I guess the good part is he's got a nice clean track. Let's take a look at the pass. Rob Nguyen went in, he, well, what he did was he tried to pitch him down and, of course, uh, got himself on the wrong line and had to back off and very nearly lost the place to Piccolo as he well. Did, yeah, Piccolo started to come down the inside. Yeah, he did, yeah. 
Up in the front, Ricardo Sparafico, who is falling backwards just a little bit to Bjorn Bergheim, while we were away, managed to stretch out the lead just a little bit. Yeah, I think he's but sort they, of calmed himself down a little bit, hasn't he, and regained his composure. For a couple laps, he was making mistakes. Yeah. He was starting to squeeze off a little too much, trying a little too hard. And I can't believe how much ground they put between themselves and Pantano. Liuzzi got back around uh, town in Bell again there, and uh, Enrico Toccacello is now in sixth spot. Nicholas Chiesa, seventh. Tony Schmidt, eighth. Yaz Lanish in ninth, and Gibler, Phil Gibler in tenth there. And Phil Gibler's in tenth right now. And remember, you know, this he had that first race last time where he was out on the second lap. So he hasn't this, had much practice. No, he hasn't had very much practice. He's never tested with the team. He ran he ran one of the Formula 3000, the uh, Euro 3000 cars, and tested in that and did very well, which is part of the reason he was able to get that. Now that is, this is for eighth. This is for the last point position. This is between Tony Schmidt and Yaroslav Yanis. And that is Phil Gibbler, the American from Oxnard, California, right behind in the Den Bois V car. So once again, the yellow car is Tony Schmidt. That's the only Astra Mega entry now that Jeffrey Van Hoydonk is gone. Then beside, behind him is Yaroslav Yanis, or Yarek apparently, as his friends call him. And then Phil Gibbler trying to take a look to the inside of Yanis. Yanis, of course, only 19 years old. Oh, 19. You have grandkids that old, don't you, David? <laughs> 19 years old. Yeah, this man ever to start in the Formula 3000 race. Oh, oh Phil Gibbler oh. goes very wide. Good job hanging on to it, though. Yeah. Good job. And now, with 10 laps remaining, I think we're beginning to see those tires drop off a lot of a uh, lot of oversteer creeping into these cars now as the tires are giving up and yeah. I wonder whether or not the lead drivers Bjorn Wordheim and Sparafico they've set their car up to protect their tires in the later stages of the race just soften the suspension a little bit all that was done before the race of course and that's enabled them to pull out that gap because they do seem to have just waltzed off into the distance really leaving everybody behind them literally waltzed off into the distance big time so Schmidt and uh, Yanis seem to put a bit of ground between themselves and Phil Gibbler. Gibbler after that last little wildish run through uh, the Castro curve. But he's still a menace right behind them. And Yanis losing a bit of ground now to Tony Schmidt. Boy, Phil Gibbler, right now he's in 10th. Wouldn't he just love to get up two more spots oh. and take that last points-paying position away? Gibbler is a yeah. four-time U.S. Grand National Karting Champ. He's been living in Europe since 1999. Oh, my oh, goodness. Oh, look at Tocicello getting behind oh, Townsend oh, Bell. Townsend Bell for fifth. This is the fifth. Oh. Oh, boy. No. He's going to make him go around the outside, which is not easy at Remus Curve. But, of course... Toccacello made just... Oh, he there he goes around Tocicello the inside of him. Did the perfect job there. Now he's got the inside line. It's a long run down now to the Gossip Curve. And Toccacello's got the inside line. It's a drag race. It is a drag it race. Is. That's what I mean about it. Oh, now that camera Sounds drops yeah, away here. Yeah, yeah. But Toccacello, you see, had the inside line. He was clever there, coming off Remus. He came off just a bit quicker, pulled up alongside the Townsend Bell, and now um, he's got him locked out. So Townsend Bell's going to have to have a heck of a struggle to get back past him. But Townsend qualified very well. Fourth fastest, the best an American has ever qualified in Formula 3000. He's doing fairly well. I'm curious if he's got some problem, or maybe, like you say, if the tires have just gone away and caused him to slip back. And now the leaders, is that... Uh, that's is it, Piccolo. That's Jean Maria. They're going around. And yeah, that's Jean Maria, who's way back. Trying to go Sandro around Piccolo. Piccolo there. But it just shows the intensity of competition in Formula 3000. These guys are all absolutely desperate to, to get near the front, and these guys are duking it out for 14th and 15th spot. <laughs> that's what it takes, because you never know what's going to happen in front of you. Multiple shunt on the last lap, and you go from 15th to 4th and suddenly pick up a lot of points. Ricardo Sperafico. You know, he's had a fairly uneventful race. He had a, that... that lap or two where he was making a few little mistakes but take a look 
But the lead that he has now stretched yeah. out over Bjorn Verheim. It's over two seconds. A while maybe, ago, it was just over about a second. I wonder maybe that run of Verheim, right? Maybe on that run of Verheim. I wonder if he ran his tires off a bit. Well, either that, or we just haven't. We've, we've missed something. I don't know whether we. The director cut back to the midfield runners, and we just miss it because that gap has has opened up enormously. Although, remember at Spain, remember when uh, um, Bjorn Verheim was trying to make the run in Pantano, and he was able to do it in the early laps, but as the race went on, he just wasn't able to challenge. His well, tire just went away. With the laps running down, maybe Christian Horde has told Verheim to just hold on to that uh, and make sure a dead sure second spot. Could well be, David. Yeah, but it's easy to say that. It's tough to get a driver sometimes to do that. All right, laps are starting to wind down. We're going to take a brief break. We'll be back with more from Austria right after this. Speed Channel's coverage of Formula 3000 is brought to you by Odor Eaters Plus Arch Support Insoles, the only arch-supported insole that protects against foot odor and wetness. Welcome back in Austria. Townsend Bell now under attack by Nicholas Chiesa. Bell in the red car with the white stripe on the front. Nicholas Chiesa, the Den V with blue in the back. And that is Rafael Jean-Maria coming into the pits. Started at the back of the grid. Had some of the excitement while everybody else was swapping places in 12th through 15th. And apparently now he's got a problem that's bringing him in. I can't see any uh, uh, obvious damage on the car. So I wonder whether or not... All right, let's take a quick look at something that happened while we were in a commercial break. And this was the battle between Tony Schmidt, Phil Giebler, and Yaroslav Yanis. And look at that. Yanis slides off, and Giebler can take advantage of it. Yeah. Take a look at that. Outbreak. He moves into ninth. Yeah, completely outbraked himself there. Got wide, uh, which gave Phil Giebler a good chance to get by him. Phil had dropped back a bit from those two when they were dicing earlier, but obviously he collected himself together and done a good job in pulling up on them and was able to take advantage when Yanis made that little mistake. Old and Phil Ricardo Giebler was there ready to pounce. Ricardo's Ferris Vico is just in a, in a race of his own now. Yeah. I mean, that three seconds, 3.14 on the, on the screen, I think is much more than that. And he's trying to take the lead in the family championship here, you know, because he wins here. This will be his second victory, his first one happening back in 2001 in Belgium. Here, and Rodrigo... Here, here, here oh, they go. Gibbler, Gibbler going, going by. by. Tony Schmidt. Has Tony Schmidt got a that problem? That is for points. Gibbler has gotten into eighth in the last points-paying position in his second race. He may score himself a point here. And he's in hot pursuit now of... Uh, Yanis. Yaroslav Yanis not going to be taking that lightly. Tony Schmidt must have a problem. He's uh, dropping off big time there. Town and here's Bell. Nicholas Chiesa. Nicholas Chiesa going around Town and Bell. I think Townsend Bell must have got a problem. Was he tagged earlier on? Did he have a little tag with somebody? You didn't see it, but uh, you never know what we didn't see. And it could have bent something like Derek Hill was saying at the beginning of the show when he got tagged it. It made his rear wheels tow out badly and added some yeah. camber to it when it bends the suspension. And I wonder if Townsend Bell's got a problem like that. Well, there's Tony, uh, Tony Schmidt, Schmidt obviously had down problems. in the pits, yeah. And right now we have two Americans in the last two points positions. Townsend Bell is in seventh and Phil Gibbler is in eighth. The two Americans, the possibility of two Americans in the points here. And for Townsend Bell, those points will be important. He has yet to score a point this year as a result of having uh, the problem in the first race where uh, he was hit from behind by Giorgio Pintano in the second race he was involved in that first turn incident ended up finishing way in the back in the pack today he wants to finish and he wants to finish in the points look at the lead now almost yeah. four seconds I, I really do think that Christian Horner has said to Verheim, you know just cool it get those other eight points because he's got a huge lead already He's got an eight-point lead over Pantano, and Pantano is going to finish a very distant third. And Toccacello is going to be in fifth. And uh, so he's all the guys that are after him uh, aren't going to get very many points. And these are these guys, the teammates at the back of the pack. This is Piccolo and Nguyen again. Piccolo got in there. Nguyen has... Nguyen spends too much time worrying about blocking people and not enough time on worrying about going fast. Yeah. So Remus. Of 
boy, look at the distance that Piccolo's put. Yeah. Now he's got a round rod you, and he's just pulled away incredibly, which is what's so frustrating when you can't get by somebody. Meanwhile, that's the leader, Ricardo Sparafico, who's coming up on him. Well, you don't often see that in uh, F3000. Well, uh, yeah, well, it's saying the cars are so closely matched, and it's very difficult to start pulling out a lead, but, I mean, I'll Obviously, a lot of it's down to the driver's talent, but you're right. You don't see him closing up on the back markers, do you? Boy, look at that. He gained almost a half a second on that lap alone. Well, you got to be careful. If they've told Bjorn Verdheim to ease off, you don't want to ease off too much in these last couple laps. <clears throat> you can see there's still a decent gap, though, between there's Bjorn Verdheim, and then way at the back of us, just going under the bridge right now, is Giorgio Pantano in the blue car. Well, Pantano, if they finish right now, will end up with 16 points, but, of course, Verdheim is going to end up with 26 all There's these guys up at the front, I mean, they're so spread out from each other. Isn't that amazing, isn't it? There's Liuzzi, there's Tuccicello, there's Nicholas Chiesa. These and are the Townsend good Bell in the red car right there. Townsend and unless I'm Bell. mistaken, that is Phil Giebler right behind him. Giebler and Yanis right behind them. That's Yanis. Just ahead of him, Phil Giebler, remember, that is the last points position. If Yanis wants any points, He's got to make a move, and he's got to do it in the next two laps. Sun getting pretty low now. Tough on his drive. Oh, that's Gianna Maria. He's yeah, you see that car, and you thought it might have been Pantano. Well, it had me well. I thought it was <laughs> Pantano, but it's uh, Gianna Maria, who's been in the pits once. And where Pantano was doing so well with his team. Oh, that's why he was yeah. going slow. Oh, oh. Hey. Oh, all the way around. He spun it there at the Jock and Rint curve, just on the pit in there, which is right there. Got it through 360, which is nice. That's why it looked like he was going so slowly through the A1 curve, because he was going slowly, because <laughs> he only yeah. just started a thing. <laughs> uh, Ricardo Sparafico leading in Austria, trying to go for his second victory, trying to get himself 10 very important points. Just one lap left. Second victory, we might add, in his career. He's had 26 starts. His first one at uh, Belgium. When was that? Uh, back in 2001. Back in 2001. And his twin brother, Rodrigo, has a victory in this series that he got last year in Brazil. So if he wins here, he will take the family lead. <laughs> These guys are so spread out, it's almost like a, a parade, a demonstration uh, uh, run, isn't it? Well, they get so involved in these big dices that they slow each other up all the time. And, of course, the leaders, who were not really dicing all that hard, uh, they were all over each other, but not actually involved in uh, blocking and all that sort of thing. That's how they get back. They, they suddenly find themselves back, you know. Townsend Bell, I don't understand quite why he has slid back so badly, uh, unless he's got some sort of a problem. Could be missing a gear. Um, his engine could be down, yeah. and, he could have, and he could have a suspension problem. And of course, if you have suspension problems in, F, in F3000, you're done for because it obviously the tire, the, the suspension is bent. I mean, it absolutely racks, you know, roots that tire. And that's the problem they had in the last race as a result of the incident at the first turn. Ricardo Sparafico finishing his final lap, coming onto the front straightaway, going to get his first victory of the year, the second of his career. Arm in the air, and he is the winner, Ricardo Sparafico. Good job, lad. Yeah. Behind him, Bjorn Verdheim. And behind him in that blue car right there is Giorgio Pantano. Remember, Pantano wasn't even supposed to be in this series this year. He was hoping to go to cart. As a result, his ride kind of evaporated. He's going to Durango. And I think uh, he's taken this team to a slightly higher level, to be honest with you. Durango's done okay over the years. But I, think, I think he's made it clear he's pretty good. Wow. This looks like and I think Phil Giebler. Ooh. Phil Giebler there. I was trying to see if he'd gotten by Townsend Bell. But it looks like Townsend still has seventh. And Phil Gibbler probably still has eight, so two Americans in the top eight. You just saw Rodrigo Spirifico there in the pits. That's this guy's twin brother. Oh, here we go, donut time. Yeah, baby. So that's why they designed those new runoff areas. For yeah, donuts. it's like a donut. <laughs> Look at that black rubber there being left down. So that's good for Colonia Motorsports. Um, you know, makes for a very interesting championship. I mean, Bjorn Verdheim, by virtue of consistency, is doing very well. But we've had three races and three winners. And they've all led from, from flag to flag. They've all been on the pole, and they've all led to the, to the flag. So, the, so the, the theory in Formula 3000 this year, get the pole. Qualify well, right. Cost, no matter what happens. 
Ricardo Sperfico, the winner. We're going to take a brief break. We'll be right back from Austria in just a moment. Welcome back to Austria, where Ricardo Spirofico has just dipped into the room, the wall. It's going to lead him up to the podium, where he's going to get his first big trophy for this year, the second of his career. Ricardo Spirofico taking the victory just ahead of Bjorn Wertheim. Don't know if Jörg Wertheim had any troubles, but he seemed content to sit back in second place, although for a while Spirofico was making a few mistakes on track, but fortunately it did not cost him the victory. This is how they finished. Spirofico first, Wertheim second, and Pentano third. Luzzi had a good run there, passing and repassing, uh, getting in front of Toccacello and Nicholas Geyser. And the guy who didn't have a very good run, unfortunately, was our man Townsend Bell, finishing up there in seventh, but Phil Gibbler did have a good run in eighth position there. Great run for him. And Yaroslav Yanis, the youngest driver out there, also didn't have a bad day. Fairly eventful, I must admit, as was Bernhard Auinger. Had a very eventful day. He was Mr. Excitement today. Boy, he, he sure was. was, yeah. And unfortunately, Derek Hill, there you see him last because he dropped out as a result of the battle. He ended up getting sideways, spun the car around. He was just clipped by Schroeder as he was going by, lost the front wing, and knocked him out of the race, unfortunately. So Derek Hill does not get to finish this race. The race goes by without any points. Meanwhile, up front, Ricardo Sparafico, one happy guy. We'll be back. It's champagne time in Austria. That means it's time for us to go. We'll be back again in two weeks from Monaco. We'll have live coverage of the fourth round of the International Formula 3000 Championship from Monte Carlo. That's on Saturday, May 31st at 9.30 in the morning, immediately following Formula 1 qualifying. And don't forget, tomorrow, 7.30 in the morning, live coverage of the Formula 1 race from Austria. So for David Hobbs, Steve Matchett, and Peter Windsor, I'm Rick DeBrule. We look forward to seeing you back here for the Austrian Grand Prix tomorrow, live on Speed Channel.